Hi, my name is James Painter. I'm a graduate student at the University of Melbourne. And on this episode of Socratic Studios, we'll be talking about some work I did uh, recently on detecting an intermediate mass black hole. And the key here is intermediate. So we have smaller stellar mass black holes, which are formed after a, a large star goes supernova and, and dies at the end of its life and leaving behind a black hole maybe 10, 10 to 50 times the mass of the sun. And way at the other end of the scale, there are supermassive black holes, which are these giant monsters, many millions to billions of times the mass of the sun, which inhabit the core of pretty much every galaxy out there. And so there's this mass gap between things that are like, you know, 10 to 100 times the mass of the sun, and then up to a million times of the sun and larger. So in between there, which is typically you know, there's not very many black holes in there, if any at all. And so it's been termed uh, intermediate mass black holes. So they're intermediate between the smaller stellar mass black holes and the larger supermassive black holes. And as I said, not many of them have been discovered so far. So they're extremely important to studies just so we can build a population of, you know, what's out there, where are they, how many of these things exist, um, and answer questions like how do they form. Uh, furthermore, they're pretty important uh, to, in understanding uh, the formation of supermassive black holes. So uh, as I've already said, there's a supermassive black hole in the, in the heart of every galaxy. And we see things very, very early in the universe that are billions and billions of times the mass of the sun. But if, if that object starts off as just a small stellar mass black hole or or something, something quite small at, at the very early stages of the universe, it actually doesn't have enough time to grow and to gain a billion, a billion times the mass of the sun within that age. So the idea uh, is that actually you have an intermediate mass black hole as a seed, and these things either merge together or rapidly accrete uh, matter in the early universe, and then that's how you get these monsters so early on. Well, by their nature, they're, they're black, so we only actually see them by their interaction with matter around them. So, you know, you see a star, it's fusing matter, it's fusing hydrogen into helium and so on, and that releases energy and it, it releases light. Whereas a black hole, by, nef by definition, uh, its escape velocity is so large that light can't escape. So it's only the stuff that's around that black hole that's interacting and falling in or... Uh, you know, doing doing whatever it's doing around the black hole that you that you see. So, uh, in the case of stellar mass black holes, we see them through uh, gravitational wave events. As the black holes merge, not only do they release electromagnetic energy, they're also releasing um, energy in gravitational waves, um, which yeah is is energy propagating along in in the metro, in the space time. Uh, continuum. So when they merge, we can detect the gravitational waves that are given off, and our detectors are currently not sensitive into the mass range of intermediate mass black holes. And for supermassive black holes, we see them in the in the cores of galaxies where they are accreting a lot of matter, and that so this matter is falling in, heating up, interacting, and getting swallowed by the black hole. But as it does that, it releases a lot of that gravitational energy as as light. So there's extremely bright objects that we can see. So if a, a black hole is not in an environment where it's merging or in an environment where it's accreting and, and swallowing gas or other material, actually it's quite difficult to see it. And if it's in a, in a part of empty space where there is no matter for it to, to interact with, then you, you don't see it at all. So we used a method called gravitational lensing, which is uh, really using the deflection of light by gravitational fields to, to probe either the gravitational field or the, or the distant source. Um, so we, use, we searched a population of sources called the gamma ray bursts. So there's these um, short flashes of, of gamma rays, uh, which are emitted um, when, a, when a stellar mass black hole is created. Okay, so there's these very short flashes of gamma rays, a couple of seconds long, give or take. And these occur... Um, all over the universe whenever it, whenever either two neutron stars collide or a massive star goes supernova and you form this 
little baby black hole, we get a flash of X rays. Okay, and as that thing is is propagating along the universe, any mass that it encounters along the way will deflect it. So, if you have this uh, particular alignment of a distant source and then something in the middle and then us here observing that object, what you'll have is that uh, massive object in the middle will bend the light as it's coming around. Its gravitational field will, will bend the path of the of the light, and in some cases you can see it uh, multiple times. So that's called um, multiple images or strong gravitational lensing. So we searched a large so source population of um, gamma ray bursts, and we found one that has shown us um, that it, it looked like it had been gravitationally lensed. So we, we uh, you know, analyzed, analyzed the data, looked into it, and we, we came to the conclusion that it, it was gravitationally lensed. And then from that, we were able to infer that the mass of the object that had been in the middle there was roughly 50,000 times the mass of the sun. So that's in the mass of an intermediate mass black hole. We we weren't the first to search um, to search for a gravitationally lensed gamma ray burst. So maybe I can talk a bit about how we improved that particular search technique um, rather than comparing apples and oranges with with the, all these other different techniques there are. Um, but basically, you you have this time series of of the gamma ray flux coming in and reaching the detector, and you know you have this series of pulses which is the gamma ray burst that you observe and then if it's gravitationally lensed you expect that same uh, copy of so a copy of that series of pulses the gamma ray burst to be copy pasted sometime later and that copy pasting is due to you seeing this having two two lines of sight onto the event you've seen it once as it travels one way and you've seen it another time as it travels the other way and there's been some time delay there due to that gravitational effect that we just discussed. So you're looking for this duplication in the light curve and you can use autocorrelation to do that. And so a lot of the earlier techniques use, or earlier searches, I should say, use the autocorrelation. And we use that as well, um, just as, as a first pass. And then actually we started modeling the pulse profile. So we fitted a function to the, to the pulses. And then we, we asked how, how similar are the different pulses in different gamma ray bursts. And we found that in this particular burst, they were uh, they were closer to being statistically identical than they were to being two separate pulses under our set of assumptions. So we took that to be uh, gravitational lensing. So we, we we iterated on the on the method of autocorrelation. We added this whole other thing where we're um, modeling the pulse profiles to give us a, a measure of how how identical. Um, these gamma ray bursts images are. I think uh, the most important thing is to find more candidates to really show that uh, this is a method that that does work. So there's a few other satellite data sets out there which can be searched, um, and they have been they have been searched previously. But uh, I think there's a total of ten thousand possible gamma ray bursts. So I think. Um, sieving over those with a fine tooth comb and really uh, determining how many lensing events are in there is probably the most uh, important thing to do um, to take that one lensing candidate or one uh, lensing detection um, into a handful of lensing detections and that will that will allow us to actually nail down how many of these intermediate mass black holes are out there because the number of those things is directly proportional to the number of lensing events that you see. So the more the more things you have in the sky, the more the chance that they will gravitationally deflect or gravitationally lens a distant source. So the more gravitational lensing events you observe of the sources, then the more of those lenses are in the sky to do that um, gravitational lensing. So I think that's the most important thing that, that needs to be addressed.